welcome to this celebration of the life of our ancestor, Jack Popley, who was tragically killed at the end of World War I when he was aged just 26. I'm delighted to say that we have representatives from all generations and from Australia, France and Great Britain. You should all have a sheet which will outline the order of our commemoration. James Wallace, great-grandson of Jack, will start the proceedings with a meditation on the didgeridoo. Jack was born on the 14th of August 1891 in Sydney, son of a successful doctor. Jack had four other siblings, Guy, Phyllis, Nell and Brian, all of whom are connected to those of us gathered here today. Jack went to the prestigious Shaw School in North Sydney with his older brother Brian and spent his school days somewhat in the shadow of Brian, who was 18 months older and excelled both academically and on the sports field. Academia was not Jack's strong point. He enjoyed drama, liked music, including singing, and did well at sport with both brothers playing for the first 15 at the same time. And in the State Athletics Championship in 1907, he beat Brian into second place in the long jump. As a father, Jack wrote to his baby son, Oh, I'm a shocking crier, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the frog, uh, saying about school that he didn't mind if he wasn't very, very brainy, but the main thing was to be a good sport. I'll pull myself together in a minute while I'm going on. Um, and later, after he died, there's a letter written by one of his teachers. And he says, my memories of Jack at school are all pleasant. I don't remember him as being particularly fond of work or extra industrious, but I'm afraid it is true that often the most likeable boys are among the lazier ones. <laughs> <laughs> he was always a boy of strict honour and upright action, and I count it a privilege to have had him and his brothers as pupils. After school, he bought a sizeable block of uncleared land in Yarran Springs, near Parks, in western New South Wales, and started to set up a farming property for himself and his future wife, Nancy. Whilst there, he wrote a letter to his brother, Brian. This is an extract from a letter from Jack to Brian, written in June 1914. Well, we are finding plenty to do to occupy ourselves. I have a gang of Chinamen burning up a paddock for a start. The paddock consists of 515 acres and they will burn up about 250 to 300 acres of it. Then I have another man ploughing up and putting in 20 acres of crop. There is yet another man fencing. He has just about finished the horse paddocks. I have some more men thinking of starting on a dam for me but we are hung up about waiting for feed. At present, there isn't any. 
This coming week, I'm starting on a new kitchen and dining room. I will have another man helping me over that. I have the timber and the accessories here now. I don't quite know what sort of job we shall make of this, as I've never tackled building before. I've never done lots of things that I've had to do up here, though. It is wonderful what you can do when you jolly well have to. Jack's brother, Brian, who was by then a doctor, joined the forces and tragically was killed in action in New Guinea, New Guinea becoming the very first Australian officer killed in World War I. It is more than likely that this had a profound influence on Jack and his decisions to join up. On January the 22nd, 1915, four months after Brian's death, Jack married his long-term sweetheart and neighbour, Nancy Sargood. They obviously doted on each other, as one can tell from the letters he sent to her. Despite his love for his family and the promise of a bright and exciting future, Jack volunteered in July 1915 and joined the army. There was no conscription in Australia at all during the First World War, but he obviously felt a need to join this conflict. This letter extract is written by Jack to Nancy in 1917 when he's at the officer training camp in Hampshire. I borrowed a bicycle this afternoon and went for a short ride with Flynn. We hadn't gone far when I spotted a boy of about 14 lying on his back in the long grass. And a darling, oh shoot, sorry, no I'm going to do it. And a darling mite of a baby, sweetly dressed and just at the groggy toddling stage, solemnly pulling grass and daisies and smothering his face in them. I felt horribly homesick all of a sudden. Darling, there are no babies or nice women here that I can talk to, just men and more men. I think I should feel quite frightened of babies, I don't think, and shy with women, I'm sure of that, if it keeps up much longer. The place is glorious now. Everything is a bright, vivid green, with daisies and primroses and violets and thick carpets everywhere. Even the common old dandelions look glorious when they come out in a yellow carpet all over the field. I love England, and she's worth fighting for. Sweetheart, I think God will end the war before long. I feel quite confident about it tonight. Last post, so lights out. Jack's son, Brian, my father, was born on November the 25th, 1916. Jack was by now working as a medical orderly on a troop ship that sailed between Australia and England, treating wounded soldiers at various locations in between. On a return journey to Australia in 1917, he was encouraged to apply for promotion as an officer, which he did. He was trained and then embarked for England as a lieutenant on the 24th of January, 1917. When he got to England, he had more training at various camps near Salisbury, from where he sent letters to his son, Brian, affectionately known by his nickname of the Frog, or Froggy. This letter is from Jack to his son, Brian, written on the 1st of October, 1917. Darling little Froggy of mine, it's a long while since your daddy wrote to you. It isn't because you are ever forgotten though, but because it's hard to pretend sometimes. I shall not be able to write to you again until I write from across the water. I'm going to hop over there in a few days time and see if I can help bring the end of the war. I hear you've got two teeth. Hooray! I hope you will never be troubled by your pegs. I also hear that you've learned to make a noise like Dada. Look after Mummy, old son. She is more precious than ever. There you are. Crawl up here and kiss me goodnight. God bless you, Froggy. Death. In November 1917, Jack went to France. He travelled firstly to Belgium and had Christmas in the trenches and had a short leave in late February in England. Then, in early March, the Germans mounted a massive campaign, Operation Michael, in an attempt to cross the Hindenburg Line. 
and separate the British and French armies and effectively win the war. A key objective was to take villas Bretonneux near Amiens as a means to control the railway and cut off supplies of food and ammunition. The British were struggling and their colonial comrades, Australian, Canadian and New Zealand, were used to strengthen the rather demoralised forces. The 33rd Battalion was sent by a rather convoluted route and arrived in the area of Villers Bretonneux on March the 29th. At an earlier time, Jack described having learnt how to march while asleep, but on this occasion said how lucky he was, having become an intelligence officer and could avoid the long march and travel by train. Various letters describe the misery of trench warfare, the mud, the cold, the lice, and the lack of sleep. One of the more harrowing passages refers to him lying in a shell hole with his faithful Batman, Morris. He wrote about Morris in a letter to his aunts, the Hook sisters. I'm puzzling my brains as to what I'm going to do about my faithful Friday, Morris, after the war. He's a priceless old thing. He follows me about all the time like Shep used to. When in the line, we have rolled into shell holes together and lain flat out in no man's land while Fritz cut the wire about six inches above our heads with machine gun bullets. If anything comes unpleasantly close, he has a habit of catching me by the hand, not because he's scared himself, but it's his aim in life to shadow me from all ills. On March the 30th, Jack was given command of a company to lead an attack on a German position near Hangard Wood. The following letters describe what happened in the final attack on that Easter Saturday. This letter is from Sergeant Partridge to Jack's mother Helen after that attack. Dear Mrs Pockley, I knew your son Lieutenant Pockley very well as he was my platoon commander for some time. I was with him when he was killed on the 30th March 1918 at Hangard Wood, quite close to Villers Bretonneux. On the evening of 30th March, we were ordered to attack the enemy at Hangard Wood. The enemy occupied a position on a hill which we were to take. Lieutenant Pockley had been given charge of B Company as Captain Cormac, our usual commanding officer, was away at school. Our colonel, on account of Jack being such a brave and capable officer, gave him charge of the company. When we were within quarter of a mile of the enemy, he opened fire on us with rifle and machine guns. Quite a number of our boys were killed and wounded, and your son, who was leading the company, was quite close to me when he was hit through the body. I went to him when he fell to see if I could be of any assistance to him. I, I told two stretcher bearers to carry him out, but he refused and told them to carry another chap who had more chance of living. I then carried him and placed him under cover as well as I could, where he died peacefully about quarter of an hour afterwards. I saw him carried back to be buried, but never got a chance to see his grave. Your son was a splendid soldier, and I found all, all the men of my platoon were proud to be with him and would have followed him anywhere. A man that refuses to be carried out so one of his men could go in his place is a son to be proud of. Yours sincerely, W.O. Partridge. The second letter was written by his commanding officer Leslie J. Morshead, and this was written to his wife Nancy. On March 30th, we were ordered to attack in a line from Marcel Cave to, to Obercourt. Jack and his company had to march about four miles over open country and were preceded by the 12th Lancers. It rained very heavily all day. He attacked at 5 p.m. without artillery support. Although the enemy had a very strong position, our fellows went ahead with their usual dash. 
Jack's company did, did magnificently, due in a great measure to his splendid leadership. During our advance, Jack was badly wounded in the abdomen and subsequently died. We buried him that night, just before we, we were relieved by English troops near battalion headquarters. Had Jack lived, he would most certainly have been recommended for a decoration. Unfortunately, only a Victoria Cross can be posthumously awarded. Knowing what he was to us in the battalion, I can in a measure appreciate your sad loss. I speak truly and sincerely when I say that he is one of the finest men that has been my privilege to meet, and one of the best officers I've ever had. He had a very high sense of duty. When he first came to the battalion, I intended to have him at headquarters, but he particularly asked to go to a company as he wished to have a platoon. This action was characteristic of him. In the trenches and in action, he inspired everyone by his courage and coolness and by his determination and leadership. He always thought of his men first. He was nothing if not unselfish and considerate. His men all loved and respected him. He had too their entire confidence. It was pleasure, it was a pleasure to work with such a gentleman. When I had to give him an order, in my mind, I counted it as done. His influence was always for good, both in the mess and with his men. It was a sad day for us when he died, and we mourn his death more than words can express. I feel that my words are so empty, I wish they could convey to you a more adequate appreciation of your husband. I used to look forward to our friendship after the war, but he has joined so many of my friends, it is all so very sad. Our hearts go out to you and your child. Our sympathy with you is deep and heartfelt. Yours sincerely, Leslie J. Morshead. Jack's death had a huge impact on many, and there were a number of letters written to Jack's family. This is one of them. Dear Mrs. Popley, thank you for your letter written on the 1st of March. It's difficult to write to you, in fact impossible, to answer your letter in the strain in which you wrote. We are so shocked and miserably sad at the news from France. We, earth blind creatures, don't be too nice to me, it makes it worse. I <laughs> cannot believe that we shall not see dear John and Darcy for a little while. To us, it seems awful, and so it is. But thanks to John's splendid faith and courage, we must know that it is true, and that they have got through their time of probation sooner than we, but that we shall meet again soon. We cannot fail to see God's purpose, and it would be nonsensical to think that they are dead and we should never see them again. John always thought that he would be killed and was not afraid, but we, of course, hated his talking like that. But his wonderful faith has taught us much. What a happy woman you must be to be his wife, and how glorious to have his son to train and bring up. I'm sorry I cannot write to you cheerfully, but we are so very sad. The children are inconsolable, and my hubby, who grew to love John during his last leave, mopes about and cannot bear to hear his song sung. Do please accept our deepest sympathy and love, and later, if you can, write to us and give us news of yourself and the dear frog. With love and a thousand good wishes, yours, Luby, Ruby Purvis. Katie Wallace, granddaughter, will lead the Lord's Prayer in the words Jack knew and loved. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. A representative of each branch of his family will now lay a tribute to Jack. They will be Trisha Kenyon, great-granddaughter. Lucy Day and Alice Archer, great-great-granddaughters. Alexi and Hugo Wallace, great-great-grandsons. Anna Cunnington and Jack Sangster, great-granddaughter and great-grandson. Jack Pockley, grandson. Jack Sangster, great-grandson, will now read from the Ode by Lawrence Binion, which will be followed by the last post and one minute's silence. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. Thank <laughs> you. 